All right. Good morning. Um, so today I want to be talking about how to design uh, user research so that it actually has an impact on your project. I am Boyan Somers. I'm a user experience designer from the Netherlands, uh, where the next DrupalCon will be. And um, in my free time, I work on Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. I'm actually the UX maintainer for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And I wrote a chapter in the uh, definitive guide to Drupal 7 about user experience. So today I want to kind of share my experiences on how to design your project in such a way that the research actually has impact. I work at a small um, user experience consultancy in the Netherlands. It's called User Intelligence. And we do research on all kinds of projects. Uh, we work on kind of the small projects with you know, non-profits where we do field studies, uh, but also the large projects, you know, the large quantitative studies where you do usability testing in you know, a dozen of countries at the same time. So it's very, uh, you know, it varies a lot. So in this talk, I want to go over how to avoid getting into those discussions like this one. You know, the participants weren't representative. We need a larger sample size. Have you ever you know, done some kind of user research where you end up in these kinds of discussions or, or something like this? We don't really need user research. Department X really knows the user. You're going like, uh, I'm not sure. Um, and you followed some kind of design process where you did you know, your research, uh, either talking to stakeholders or actually talking to users. You did your design uh, implementation and, and perhaps you did some optimization after that. So this session won't cover the kind of how-tos on how to do usability testing or interviewing or stuff like that. It's really for that one time that you did manage to sell uh, user research of some form in your project and you're struggling to make sure that you know, this user research actually has an impact on that project. Because it's, I think it's quite often in projects that, that we get 90% of the way there when it comes to the user experience, but that last 10% really makes the ordeal a little bit difficult. And, and this happens with a lot of projects, right? Where the user experience is kinda okay, but in the end of the day, it's just not good enough to either compete or to just give a good user experience to your users. So I don't think you know, this is a matter of priorities. You know, they got the right priority that, they sh that it should be accessible, but it's, it's in the execution where the problem is. Because I think many organizations already realize um, how important user experience is for, for their products. It's, it's quite often that they're already using a lot of products that have a, you know, a great user experience themselves. Yet when they go out and you know, build products, it's often that they end up being pretty bad or, or kind of okay from a user experience perspective. So I think a lot of clients see that their website or their product, you know, it doesn't really offer that great experience and we can help them get to that point. Because it's, it's always, there's always a part of the business that is, is hurting because of this bad user experience. And I think in a lot of markets today, it's, it's not really just about competing on features anymore. It's also about competing on the overall user experience. Now, even something like the iPhone, was, when it was introduced, it wasn't a great competitor on features. You know, it lacked a lot of things that at the time were very competitive in the market, like you know, video chatting. But it did compete on user experience. And so the company that I work with, we do a lot of research on you know, apps, on responsive websites, on you know, the, the kind of common desktop experience. And I think what we find is that people often prefer the mobile experience, being it an app or a responsive website, uh, they prefer it over uh, the desktop experience, so any website that you're using on your desktop. It doesn't matter in which context they're at. Even when they're at home 
and the laptop is only two steps away, uh, they prefer the uh, experience on, on the mobile. And I think this is because it's in, you know, a lot of those websites and apps simply offer a better user experience around the core functionalities. I think a lot of users are more confident that they can successfully fulfill tasks using this platform. And I think this is in part because mobile platforms have a lot more focus. I think stakeholders, users, you know, everyone who's involved knows that when you're designing for mobile, it has to be more focused you know, because of there's, you know, there's less screen estate. So I want to talk about these six parts um, that you will encounter whenever you're doing some kind of user research um, and how to you know, pick the right stakeholders to be involved in the process, to choose and communicate uh, your method, your recruitment, and test material, and then finally how to report it in a way that it actually has an impact on the organization, and then to figure out what impact uh, all of those changes have on the actual organization. So I think a big part of having a successful research process, whatever you're doing, surveys or uh, interviews or usability testing, it's, it's about finding the people who are most affected within that organization by the bad user experience. And it's often not the development team that you're engaged with that's experiencing all of those you know, bad user experience moments. It's the sales manager or the support team lead. You know, it's all those kinds of people who are in direct contact with the user uh, that get all of that negative feedback when the experience isn't good. So for example, um, if you have an interface like this and you're a sales guy, you're gonna have troubles. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult proposition. Um, so whenever the product in itself, you know, on the initial look, is, is hard to explain to customers, uh, the sales team is gonna have troubles. But it's also repeat sales, right? Whenever um, they get back to the client, try to sell them an upgrade, um, they will get the feedback that the end user is having trouble using their system. But it's also support. They have something like this, where they, you know, support has to explain inexplicable user interfaces. You know, having to add guidelines and, and a lot of documentation to explain how it works. Or where support has to always respond to the same questions over and over again because, those, uh, because the user experience isn't good. So, one story, um, last year, I was working on a project for, for a large telecom provider in the Netherlands. And, and what we did is we investigated how their um, uh, online channels were performing uh, in, in getting customers to the right support channel. So, for example, as you know, something like you know, a live chat support channel, I think that's about 50 to 80% cheaper than having someone actually you know, call in and actually having someone email is, is even cheaper than the other options. So while we were working on this project with the product team, um, we found that they really had no clue what the like, top 10 questions were in each channel. And uh, this really impacted the project. So what we did is we reached out to the support team who was handling all of these questions. And, and we got a lot of feedback from them. We got feedback from uh, you know, what were the actual top questions, but also how uh, you could get people into those support channels more effectively. Like one example would be chat. Um, what they found is that in, in the chat channel, the chat support channel, that people had to get the feeling that they were talking to a real person. So some of the design tweaks we made is like you know, showing an actual name, uh, making sure that the first response of the chat, the, the support chat, wasn't a you know kind of bot-like response, so that it was more natural. And and what we saw that the uh, conversion on those channels got a lot higher because we made a lot of small tweaks and not necessarily big ones. So the support channel were the people that were actually hurting, and involving them uh, helped create a, a much better user experience. 
and it actually also cleared up a lot of budget for us to continue improving that particular part of the experience. So this is probably a, a comic that, that you all know. Um, it shows how each stakeholder has kind of a different picture of what the end product should be like. And it's not unto, you know, uncommon that on, on, on projects where you do user research, that you're kind of the mediator between all of these different departments, understanding which one is most connected to the actual end user, and helping make sure that their voice is heard in the process. So sometimes it's just repeating their knowledge. Um, sometimes it's actually helping them inform their, uh, their understanding of the end user so that they can provide better services, better sales, better support. So the first big thing I want to be talking about is method. Um, I think whenever we do user research, uh, we're often bound by a lot of restrictions, right? Uh, usually there's very limited budget for doing user research. Uh, there's limited time in you know, the development process for that user research to take place. So we have to be kind of creative with choosing our methods and making sure that you know, the one that we do choose actually has an impact. So we actually have a lot of clients that come up to us and say, I want a usability test or I want a survey. And, and this is actually troublesome because no, no one's going up to their dentist and saying, I need a cap on my number teeth 16. Because you know, that's, that's an ex expert question, right? And uh, whenever that happens, when the client comes to you, I want a USB test or a survey or, or a particular uh, user research method, you miss part of the discussion where they decided and, and defined the actual problem that they're trying to solve. And you also missed part of the discussion where they chose the best method to resolve that. And I think, frankly, it's, it's always good to be part of that discussion because it's very important for user research to get um, a really clear understanding of what they're asking. Because sometimes the question is too broad and it's hard to pick the right method. And sometimes it's too narrow where you're uh, not looking at all of the connecting parts. So, we often use the following graph um, to understand what clients are looking to answer and to explain what each method brings. So the first question we ask is, is the client trying to understand um, beliefs and understandings of users? So what they say. And, and this is really where the client has a need to understand the kind of attitudinal part uh, of the user when they're using the product or website. So the other thing that we're looking at, is the client trying to solve uh, a problem where they're trying to understand what their users do with their product, what kind of behavior they express. So another thing that we look at is, is the other axis. Is it a qualitative question? So does the client need to understand why people are having trouble with their product? Or is it a quantitative question where they really need a number to explain certain behavior or opinions, or they just need a number to convince their you know, other departments that, that they're making the right decision. So we're always a little bit careful with the quantitative question, um, because it's not too uncommon that people just like numbers, right? They just like to see uh, numbers to confirm their thoughts. But they don't actually need them to make the project go forward. Uh, and doing user research where it's, you know, very quantitative in nature, it can be a little bit expensive. Uh, not always, but, but uh, especially when you're doing USB testing or those kinds of things and you're looking for numbers, it's, it's quite hard. So using the schema, um, we try to explain to clients what each method will bring them, uh, whether it will answer a behavioral question, whether it will answer a quantitative or a qualitative questions. And most importantly, we can tell the client what each method won't bring them, what kind of data they won't, shouldn't be expecting. Because I think it's very tempting to do a survey or, or those kinds of user research methods and trying to just get all of the questions in and ask everything of the user. And it's very tempting to do that because you, know, you sold user research that one time and, and you really want to make sure that you try to do as much as possible. But this often leads to very inconclusive answers 
where you get you know, kind of a picture, but not the complete picture. So we try to focus on fewer questions, but at least focus on the questions that we know with this method we can actually get an answer to. So if we look at, at a couple of the methods, uh, usability testing, I think the most popular one, right? Uh, next to surveys. Uh, because usability testing is a great mix of attitudinal data, you know, people are carrying out tasks, and behavioral data, um, oh, sorry, the other way around. So attitudinal, how people perceive things, and behavioral data, how they actually uh, interact with the website or product. And, and the other way is, is focus groups. Focus groups are often very useful for getting kind of an understanding how a concept is perceived, especially when you're in that first stage where you're really just trying out different ideas. Another thing is, um, on the other axis, the quantitative part. So like A-B testing or data mining. You know, very useful tools to get insight into what people are actually doing on your website. Another one is intercept studies, where you give the user a pop-up uh, when they show certain behavior on, the, on your website. So they're you know, moving through the cart, for example. And at the end of the day, pretty much any method that's in the user research spectrum could be added to this graph. And it's a schema that's created by Christian Rohar. Uh, and I think he shows like a dozen more methods mapped to this. But in all, it's a, it's a frame of mind to help the client understand uh, what the method will bring. And I think it's also interesting to show this one. Um, there's a lot of online tools now. And this is really a market that came to life in the last probably a few years, where uh, doing user research online with online tools gotten a lot easier. And, and I'm quite excited about them. I use many of these here. For example, we use TreeJack to find out whether navigation changes work, where we you know, kind of benchmark two different navigation trees against each other. We use Loop11 uh, to test workflows in the prototype. So whether the you know, flow going through the application or the website, whether that makes sense. And we use usertesting.com uh, whenever we're doing usability testing in like 10 different countries and we want to get the results fast. So some of these tools are, are really easy, uh, like TreeJack, uh, like Usabilla, and, and can easily be put to use and are very inexpensive. And the other tools like Zoom, uh, user Zoom are, are a lot more expensive, but can answer a lot more complex user research questions. So I think the takeaway when it comes to method is show why you chose a certain method to kind of uh, take away that part of the discussion. And you know it helps you take away that part of the discussion where the client or part, you know, part of the team goes like, why didn't you do a survey? It, that's less expensive. But then you can go back, yeah, but we're trying to answer a different question. And it also helps you scope your user research. You know, focusing in on the questions that you can answer with a specific method and showing what data they should be expecting and what they shouldn't be expecting. But it's also leaving a lot more room for answering uh, all of those other questions that tend to come up. And you say, you know, this is not the method that is going to answer that question, but if you want, we can do a lot more research to answer those questions. So, so that's method. Um, I think whenever you do user research, um, at some point you're always going to do some recruiting, whether that's recruiting uh, you know, stakeholders at the clients, uh, end users, or anything else. Uh, in each method, you will generally get users involved. So what we found, and it's, it's not very uncommon, that after a day of usability testing, uh, you get the feedback that you know, the user didn't quite fit the audience. Because what they're looking for is really someone who's just like them, who knows the product just as well as them, and um, who's just as smart as them, right? Um, and what they know is their audience isn't like that, but, but that's what uh, you know, they're faced with. Because even when you've recruited straight from, from their user base, it's not uncommon to get this feedback. It's because it's, I think it's often tempting to blame the person in front of the user interface 
uh, rather than blaming the actual user interface. So what we do is uh, we heavily involve the client in this recruitment process. So we develop a screener with them, which is kind of the criteria that a participant must met. And we try to define as exact as possible what they're really looking for. And we'll also involve them in the actual recruiting of these participants. Um, so we either ask them to help out getting participants or whenever we're using like a recruitment form, uh, we ask them to validate the people that we found. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to find the people that they're looking for. And when you're trying to find that like middle-aged man who's tech savvy, living in Austin with pink hair and you know, two degrees, it's gonna be hard. You're gonna have trouble finding them. So having them being part of that process also uh, makes sure that you're reaching the right people and you know, whenever you can't, uh, at least they will fit on the people that you know, aren't quite meeting the criteria but are fine anyways. So that's recruitment. Um, the other thing I want to be talking about is test material. Um, so when I talk about test material, I, I'm thinking like uh, sketches or mock-ups or paper prototypes, HTML prototypes, um, or the real thing, you know, if you've actually already built it. And, you know, having done a lot of usability testing, um, what, what we find is that no matter what you're testing, whether it's a screenshot or a prototype, users have a lot of difficulty understanding the difference between low fidelity and high fidelity. So even when your you know, design has looks very sketchy, but it still has a number of elements that look like the real thing, people will believe it's the real thing. So it's very important, I think, uh, to either shoot for low fidelity, so paper prototypes and really sketches, uh, or to just go somewhere in the middle and explain to the user that it's, you know, it's not the real thing, but it's close. So another thing that we learned with test materials, uh, whenever you're developing them, it's, uh, especially when you're working with larger teams, there's always some discussion after that you didn't test the right thing. You either, uh, you know, tested part of the flow that was broken, or um, they didn't carry out the right tasks. Especially with usability testing, you see this a lot. And, and what we find is that having the clients kind of proof the scenarios or the questions that you developed is, is a big part in making sure that they're involved and making sure that you're not missing anything. So it helps them validate the right scenarios and it makes them catch you know, any bugs or perhaps things that could be improved really quickly uh, before you do your user research. But another thing, and, and I think this is the most important part of having them kind of test run uh, whatever user research approach you developed, is that it's a, it's a practice run. Because they see you know, users carry out the same tasks a few days later, when they actually carry that out themselves, they can see how different the user experience is from their, you know, their perspective and that of the user. And, and that realization that the user comes from a different kind of base level of understanding, I think that's key in making sure that your user research lands. And it's a fundamental realization that will also help you a lot in the future uh, whenever you're discussing your results. So I think a key takeaway here is that, so ask your stakeholders or your, the team that you're involved with to test run your approach from answering questions to trying out scenarios. And involve the whole team of potential stakeholders in this process is a very effective way of uh, validating your approach. Uh, and, and sometimes this means that you get a lot of feedback from a lot of different people. And um, it's always important to keep in mind, you know, the amount of questions you can ask. Sometimes, you know, more than 30 questions or, or whatever in a survey is gonna be bad. So, you know, keep in mind you can't ask everything and you can explain it to them using, you know, the graph that I showed earlier that this is, you know, this is the method that we're trying to answer these questions and not the other ones. And it's also helping them 
uh, with conflicting priorities, especially when you're uh, you know, talking to a lot of different departments and, and they're all involved. Um, you can always refer to the project brief or the creative brief and, and say, you know, this is the, the part that we're touching upon with this user research. So the other thing I want to talk about is reporting. So communicating uh, whatever you did, whatever user research you did, communicating that to the client. And yeah, I mean, what we found over and over again is that um, most clients don't really need a report. Uh, they maybe ask for it, but they don't really need it. And um, what they actually need is something that can be easily communicated to the larger team that they're working with. Um, and, and a trick that we use is, is we ask the client um, how the results we act will actually be communicated internally uh, surrounding the project. And sometimes this means that they're just sending an email to the whole team but in a lot of other times, they are using some kind of project management tool to uh, get the results into actionable, you know, workable to-dos. So, an example is um, Drupal. Whenever we do user research for Drupal, uh, whether that was Drupal 7 or Drupal 8, we rarely created these you know, full reports. Instead, what we did is we defined the problems and then we wrote them up in the issue queue. This is kind of Drupal's you know, ticketing system. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is where everyone lives and this is where all the work gets done. So being part of that system is key in making sure that the results actually get translated to you know, something that has impact on the project. So it's a great way of making kind of a living deliverable uh, something that's directly tied to the environment where changes happen. Uh, I think there's a lot of other ways, though, to engage stakeholders with deliverables that are, are you know, kind of different than your ordinary report. So, users often have kind of this mental model of how a user interface is structured. And, um, you know, designers or, or programmers think about the left side and go like, yeah, it's, you know, it's nicely structured, nicely round. Users feel like it's magic. You know, there's lots of stuff happening. I'm not sure what's happening, but it works. <laughs> Especially with the more complex user interfaces like booking sites, um, it's, it's, it's very common for it to feel like magic. And this can be of various reasons, right? It, it might be that the actual concept that you're trying to communicate is just hard to capture. So for example, you know, when you're building a, a UI for neurosurgeons, you're, you know, it's going to be difficult. And it requires a high level base understanding to know what you're doing with that user interface. But the more likely scenario is, is that the user interface is unable to actually communicate all of the different parts. So we make use of concept models um, to show what the parts are and to show where users have a disconnect. So this is an example. Um, this is kind of trying to capture the bigger picture of the views to user interface. And this is the one that Roy Schrotten created. And so it captures all of the different parts of that user interface. And by using a model like this, you can show uh, what part of the interface is having the disconnect, where people are struggling. Because it's often not the whole interface, but it's just certain concepts that they're not getting. So you can see how the system is put together and then how the user thinks the system is put together. So it's a great, great mechanism to capture the kind of more complex user interfaces where there's a lot of moving parts and, and you're trying to make sure that you know, people understand what you're talking about. Uh, another thing that we use a lot is, uh, this is called a web traffic map. Um, I think what we often see when we do user research and we involve stuff like web analytics in that process, we see that the client has trouble understanding and grasping what, what, you know, what these web analytics data say and what they mean and how they should drive priorities. So one of the things that we do more and more is uh, instead of giving them you know, the, go the good looking uh, Google Analytics graphs that are really hard to understand, we give them uh, kind of a more custom tailored report or 
something like this that you could actually hang up on the wall, where we handpick certain indicators that we think you know, those are the most important and those can easily drive priorities or understanding. Another thing would be customer journey maps. Um, I think customer journey maps are a great way of showing the client in a rather explanatory format the complete journey that a user takes and kind of follows with that product. Because it's often that the product only, uh, or the website, is only a, you know, a part of that process. And this is a map that we made for, uh, for patients that, that have prostate cancer. Uh, and, and we showed them you know, what the whole process was like, and then we picked particular uh, parts of that experience where their website was helping or not helping the patient. And I think what's interesting also is that a customer journey map can help, for example, sales teams understand that they're part of a larger, a, a larger picture, a larger experience that the user has. Because I think in a lot of processes now, sales has to go beyond the notion that it's, you know, that their sale is made in a particular uh, part of that channel like you know, just the desktop and just when the patient is getting their treatment. Um, it's often won and lost on, on many parts of that experience where the user is, is, you know, is touching upon their product. So making sure that you show that is, I think, a very big part of showing that bigger user experience. But no matter what your deliverable is, um, I think it's always good to tell the whole story. Uh, and we use this kind of pyramid model where uh, it's, it's kind of a top-down approach where we start off and introduce the client to the overarching findings, you know, the navigation that was troublesome, the terminology that was different and wasn't matching with expectations, or perhaps that you know, uh, the features that were expressed weren't actually you know, required by the user. And from that kind of holistic picture, of the overarching, the big picture, we kind of deduce down to the detailed findings of how certain interactions performed and how they influence that larger picture. Because I think, especially for a lot of clients, it's, it's very easy to get bogged down in the details and to be worrying about whether a button should be left or right when the actual concern with the user is that they can't even find the, you know, find the page where the button is left or right. So, uh, making sure that you capture that bigger picture, that you know, holistic part of, of the process is, is very important in kind of your added value there. Um, the other thing is, is be brutally honest about the results. I think whenever you do user research, uh, you know, when you're asking people's opinion, they're gonna be honest with you. So um, they might say that things that the client doesn't like or they might say things that the client has been debating forever and um, you know, that they're giving a, a new direction or a direction that the client doesn't like. But at the end of the day, you are you're, you're, you're have the role of the observer. And I don't think you should be judging whether uh, you know, findings should be included or not. Uh, at the end of the day, the client can decide on himself to ignore certain parts. Um, but you know, they will all influence the product. So an example, um, I think as we keep improving interfaces, um, a lot of changes won't be noticed by the larger audience that you're using. So for example, vertical tabs. This is uh, in Drupal 7, we introduced this on the content creation screen and it's a way to kind of group all of the you know, settings. And it was a very good thing when we introduced it because it reduced a lot of clutter. But like the research we did after that, not one user mentioned that it was a good thing because people felt it was, you know, it's a good thing. So why should I comment on it? So, you know, this I think is a part of a good development when the user doesn't notice it anymore. Uh, but it is something to at least report on uh, when you're doing findings and making sure that you also communicate all of the things that are actually working and are usable. So make sure that you pick the right deliverables 
and that you don't work on a large report, although it might be fun, but uh, it's not the most useful deliverable in an organization to have an impact. Um, try to pick deliverables that can kind of live in the organization, that can be you know, put up on the wall, or that they can live in their you know, whatever project management system they're using. And, and try to make sure that you're telling the whole story and not just the details. So the last thing I want to be talking about is impact. Um, I think a way to have impact on, on a project with user research, you know, the, that time that you did sell it, is to understand what the monetary impact is of any suggestions that you make. You know, at the end of the day, whatever suggestion you make is going to cost money. So our added value is often in balancing kind of the impact on the user experience, you know, making it better, and the costs that are involved with making it better, you know, building the business uh, and, and all of that. So a few months ago, I worked on this project, um, which was an, an app, and it had undergone rigorous testing. I think we were in the like, fourth round of usability testing. And what we found is they, they have this landscape mode in their app. And although it was better than you know, the last three usability testing rounds, uh, it still really wasn't offering that good user experience that you know, end users wanted to have and that they wanted to present. And I think instead of focusing on the details and figuring out how to make the landscape mode better, what we did is we asked the users, um, you know, what are you expecting from a landscape mode? for this particular app, and um, you know, what do you require? What should absolutely be in there? And as it turns out, um, people didn't care. They didn't really care for the landscape mode because this was a particular app that was going to be used a whole lot more in portrait mode than in landscape mode. So people had no strong feelings about it. And, and that was interesting because you know, that's not the angle that they took at it. So instead of suggesting to them, um, you know, continue improving landscape mode, what we actually did is we said, users don't find it very important. Um, you know, let's not continue improving it. Let's just scrap it from the project and keep improving portrait mode because that's where 99% of the people will want to engage it with. So it's about understanding what are the basic needs, and, and sometimes that maps, and sometimes it doesn't. So we use this model, which is the, the, the Kano model, and it was created by uh, Norikai Kano in, I think, the 1980s to explain to uh, clients why their product uh, wasn't creating that kind of great or satisfactory user experience. So there's, there's two axes. There's the degree of achievement on the X. Uh, this is really how well a given feature is executed in your product and left being very poor and right being very well. So the other one is, uh, on the y-axis, is customer satisfaction. So how satisfied people are with the product. Uh, bottom being you know, very dissatisfied, top being very satisfied. And um, so in this model, um, we have basic attributes. And, and basic attributes kind of represent the features that um, are so basic to the product that you're using, that people just expect them to work. People just expect them to be there. And, and these are the kind of features that people often take for granted in a product. And an example of this is in, in Drupal 8, we now have uh, you know, a WYSIWYG editor in, in, in core. I think pretty exciting for the people here at DrupalCon, um, but for most people outside of the kind of Drupal world, they go like, wait. It didn't have a WYSIWYG editor in yeah. Drupal. And it's a basic need, right? That's what they expect from a content management system, that, that, that it has that. And another example would be you know, toilet rolls in your room. Uh, you're definitely expecting that when you're in your hotel room that they have that there. And you're not necessarily happier when there's you know, three or four rolls, but uh, you're definitely not happy when there's no rolls, right? So. When, when it comes to these basic attributes, um, I think it's people aren't more satisfied when you're meeting those needs. 
but when you actually leave them out, when you don't have a WYSIWYG -wick editor or you don't have those toilet rolls in your hotel room, um, it doesn't matter how you know how great the product is. Otherwise, people will feel that it's you know it's it's it's, it's broken. It's not meeting their needs. So you should be on the lookout for these these meeting these you know uh, these basic attributes and seeing whenever you're missing them. Now for a school site, this might be that they don't have a map right of the campus site. That's a basic attribute that people expect on a school website. So. The other attribute that I want to be talking about is performance attributes. This is where there's kind of a direct correlation between the satisfaction and the degree of achievement. So kind of the more, the better. And these, these are the kind of attributes that are often expressed when you're interviewing users or you're talking to users. Like for example, you know, the amount of bandwidth and space that you get with your web hosting provider. Generally, more is better. Uh, the same is for like waiting in the airports. You know, less time waiting in the airport generally is better. So these are attributes where uh, you can easily compete upon, uh, and that companies often do, right? Like bigger megapixel cameras and all of that. Uh, these are the kind of attributes that are very common to compete on. So the light uh, attributes they represent the kind of unexpected, um, where you delight the customer by over-delivering or giving them something they didn't expect. And I think for a short amount of time that was like, you know, uh, internet on an airplane, where you're like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. So the interesting thing about these delightful attributes is um, whenever a user is actually delighted, uh, it tends to kind of be uh, resulting in over-excitement. Like people feel like the product is great, and it's a very effective way, you know, to do that word of mouth marketing. So, this is the Kano model, and I think it's important to note though that these delightful attributes, you know, these really great interactions, they become basic over time. I think as a company starts to compete on these delightful features, customers get accustomed to it. So, for example, uh, Motorola, you know, in the last few advertisements that I saw from Motorola, they don't advertise anymore that you don't need like a bulky battery and transmitter to carry around. No, that's not a selling point anymore. It's something that is now part of the market and uh, it's not a delightful feature anymore. But when it was introduced, it's pretty cool you didn't have to carry around a bulky battery and transmitter. So, if you take a look at, for example, content management systems, uh, and particularly in 2.8 now, we see that there's kind of these basic, basic attributes that people expect, like being able to create content, being able to categorize their content, and being able to add you know, media to this content. These are you know, part of the basic attributes. I think there's like at least a dozen more uh, that people just expect when they're using a content management system. Um, and there's certain performance indicators as well with content management systems. I think speed, you know, the faster your website is, generally the better. Um, I, I don't think I've seen anyone who likes slow websites. Um, supporting platforms, you know, does it run on my particular technology stack, um, you know, database or otherwise? Obviously this kind of depends on the complexity it introduces, but generally the more platforms that we support, the better. And then there's, you know, things that delight users. I think in Drupal 8, uh, inline editing is, is one of those features that could actually be considered a delightful feature. It's, it's not necessarily something that people expect from a content management system, especially the open source ones. And I think it's implemented in such a way that it can actually be delightful, actually be helpful in content editing. So the same goes for uh, WAI ARIA. It's, uh, it's a technology to help um, make interfaces that are, that are highly interactive, like uh, the interface for views or fields uh, or blocks, uh, to make that accessible for people who are using you know, this, the assistive technologies, like for example, screen readers. 
And this is a technology that's really groundbreaking and, and it's used somewhat in other applications and other content management systems, but not as extensively as we are doing it. So whenever we're working with a client, we're trying to evaluate how well are their uh, attributes performing on this Kano model. Uh, this is to kind of give them a picture of where they should be focusing in their efforts. If they're not meeting a basic need, that's where they should be initially focusing their efforts. Um, if we look at Drupal 8, I think we can see two features that are kind of underperforming right now. Um, speed, Drupal 8 isn't particularly fast. It scales better, but it's not fast. And uh, media handling, something We've done a lot of work to get that in there, but it's it's still not quite there, you know. The user interfaces aren't there. So what user research uh, does is, is you're trying to find, are we meeting the basic expectations? Okay, great. Are we actually competing on the performance attributes? Great, right? That's, that's something that, that's easy to compete on. And are we providing them with delightful features? Perhaps, maybe not. So when we're working with clients and, and the research that we do, we tend to see kind of this extreme focus on adding delightful features. But it, it, it often happens that these delightful features kind of take away the focus from the basic features, the things that should always be there and working well. And this is where users kind of feel like, but you know, you're adding this fancy feature, but you don't got the basics right. And they feel like this kind of fluffy, Cute feature is adding unnecessary clutter and the app or website or product is missing the point. So most of the projects that we work on are tend to be feature driven, right? People, I think we operate in a world where it's more features, uh, you know, new version numbers, etc. But you know, even user experience is often marketed like, you know, we're now releasing version 1.8 of our new product and it will have even more user friendliness. You'd be like, oh, really? Because in the end of the day, you want to be in a world where it's, it's not just enough that we build products that are understandable, usable, satisfactory. We want to be building products that bring joy, excitement, pleasure, and fun. And I think Dries in his keynotes clearly showed, right, there's, there's quite a road ahead of us uh, where we're actually bringing those products that, that offer a kind of a seamless user experience. So to recap what my uh, presentation was about is um, you know, try to find the right stakeholders, try to find the people that are hurting, uh, try to involve them in every step from choosing the method, explaining them why the method is good or not good, and uh, involving them in the process that you're recruiting participants, having them proof all of your test material, and then making a deliverable that can actually live in the organization. It's not just a report that gets stuck up in some kind of drawer. And finally, um, impact. You know, knowing what the impact is of your suggestions on the whole of the project. And that's what I came to talk about today. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I can repeat it, though, if you want to. Uh, thank you. Is that good? So the big conundrum I've run into is the vast difference between low fidelity and high fidelity. Right. Um, yeah, user testing. Mm -hmm. Because so obviously if you work with a good designer, there's going to be a vast difference between a grayscale wireframe or prototype that's set in one font with no color or contrast mm -hmm. uh, compared to something that's what's actually being built. Mm -hmm. So if you can only choose one point in the project to do user testing, um, when do you do it? Um, generally, my advice would be as early as possible. Because a lot of times um, when, you're, when you have the kind of finished product and you're testing it, uh, there's less time and budget to actually improve it. Yeah. 
And, and what happens on early in the process is that you can find out whether you have the right focus in your product. Because sometimes it's, it's not about you know, where the buttons is and, or how they are visualized, but it's whether there should be a button in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, when it comes to fidelity and, and usability testing, I generally say earlier on is better because a lot of designers know what they're doing and um, you, know, you shouldn't be you know, worrying too much about usability if, if it's a good designer. Have you seen? So I just want to follow up. Sure. Have you done any research between like the difference between a wireframe and the actual what is built and the actual comps that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we I mean, do a I lot. Yes, there could be a vast difference in the use. I would imagine that a good designer, the usability of the actual site, um, would be a lot better because there's a big red button that they want you to click on that says donate. Right. Well. Yeah. So, so when it comes to when you're actually like really just testing the usability, mm -hmm. uh, the real website is a lot better to, or the real thing is a lot better yeah. to test on. Um, but often, uh, so so when we whenever we're testing like early on in the process and later on in the process, what we find is is early on in the process you get, especially on sketches, you get a lot more feedback on the concept whether the concept is correct, and when they have the real website. They don't focus as much on the concept as they do on whether the button should be blue or red or whether it's yeah. positioned correctly. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Hi. Uh, I had a question about the, the matrix when you're trying to determine where your efforts should go. Mm -hmm. So assuming you have covered the basics because you're not going to make a product that doesn't do the basics, uh, it seems like the, the features that delight have uh, if we know that they will eventually become basics, or many of them will, uh, in order to get the most impact from them, you want to be first to market. So the iPhone is a great example. They were first to market on a lot of things that are standard features on virtually every phone now. Um, how do you make the decision between uh, performance, uh, the, the sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, I guess, return on investment for performance-based? feature or a delight feature because the the cost and the metrics for their success are so different one's qualitative and one's quantitative right yeah um, I think yeah there's different strategies at play I think uh, when you're in a market uh, where there's heavy competition on uh, the performance attributes um, then uh, it makes a lot of sense to invest your time in delightful attributes Whenever you're in a market, you know, like, like Uber, for example, where the focus is a lot on the delightful attributes, then it makes sense to focus your efforts on performance attributes. So it kind of depends. And um, I think the interesting thing about delightful attributes is that um, uh, they have a very strong return on investment because they help you sell your product. Uh, because it gets people excited and it tends to help with the word of mouth. So. Yeah, m yeah. Generally, I would advise to look at the market space. Go where there's more margin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, other questions? So you've um, done some focus groups and some user testing, and the team agrees that uh, you know you want to get rid of some pieces of the website, mm -hmm. and um, but the senior executive sponsor wants to hold on to those pieces like a sacred cow. How do you, like, can you give me some tactics on some ways that you can talk to them to try and make them understand that that may not be the best decision? So so was that senior, uh, was he involved in the user research? She was, yes, and, um, you know, has been deeply involved in a lot of the focus okay. groups and still is not listening. Okay. That's tricky. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, we've had it a couple times, and um, yeah, sometimes yeah, the, the focus is not in the right place. They're trying to focus on protecting their baby, the thing that they've been working on for maybe you know, five years before you came in. So it's hard to get them to kind of let it, let it go. Um, another thing that we, we, we do, sadly, more and more, is that we uh, provide them with a lot of data. So whenever there's a lot of conflict between... Um, uh, between stakeholders, what we are is we're mediating with data. So we're giving them a quantitative number and saying, you know, I know that you really think this is important, but you know, 800 users said it wasn't important, and that's when that's a way to break that 
kind of paradigm where they're still really focused in their own opinion. Does that answer your yeah. question? All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you.